Uh, first, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my conspirator and co-partner in this, Vivian Manask. Vivian uh, is the founder of Manask Isaac Architects. She's also a former chair of Athabasca University, uh, my boss, and that's no reason why we did the book together. Uh, she was also uh, the uh, president of Architecture Canada for a while, and during that period, she did something very remarkable. She uh, worked with me to introduce uh, the first online architecture program in Canada, in fact, in North America. It's a huge, huge uh, endeavor. We're very, very pleased that we could work together on that. She, her, her practice has been uh, instrumental in the green movement and sustainable architecture in Canada. She's done remarkable work uh, there. But most remarkable of all, I think, is this particular uh, book, which is her memories uh, of uh, her uh, years in practice. Her practice is unusual because she learned so much from the clients and the people she worked with, the Indigenous people of the North. And she pointed out to me one day, it was that practice, that connection with the Indigenous community that made her change her way of doing things uh, and how she managed that practice. And it was the, the teachings of the elders that made such an incredible difference. So to start this, uh, this conversation back and forth, the first thing I'll ask uh, Vivian uh, to do is to talk about the spark that I still remember that first conversation where she wrote me into working on this. Uh, what sparked you to do this, uh, th this, uh, this book uh, and to get, inv get involved and articulate a new paradigm for architectural practice? Vivian? Well, thanks, Fritz, uh, and thank you for that introduction, and uh, thank you for all for joining us here this evening. Um, you know, this journey of working in collaboration with Indigenous communities really began very, very early in our practice and has informed so much of our work. Um, I'm delighted to have Diana Steinhauer here this evening, and Diana was actually my first teacher, and uh, she was gracious enough to write the foreword for the book. So thank you, Diana. Um, but also really introduced me and our team into the Indigenous ways of knowing and Indigenous ways of approaching design. And after having continued this practice based on what I learned from Diana and her father and some elders that she introduced me to and other elders that I learned from over the years. Um, it just really seemed essential to share this set of stories um, with the broader community, with the architectural community, because I think it informs uh, a way of thinking about architectural practice uh, with the sustainable buildings community, because I think it's very critical at this time of climate emergency that we be thinking about new ways of designing our built environment. Um, and at this time of reconciliation where people are talking about attending to what we can learn from indigenous ways of knowing. So it just seemed really timely. And Fritz, as you know, this has been a ra rather long journey. I would have loved to have had this book written five years ago, but um, you know, these things take time and you've been uh, remarkable in uh, teaching me the patience that it requires to actually publish a book that's um, relevant and resonant. Okay, I mean, I can, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll add a bit to that too, Vivian, if that's okay. It, yeah, please. I, I was very fortunate as a, professor, as a professor at the University of Calgary to work with a graduate student called Troy Patnode. Troy's dissertation was on art, which I consider architecture art in a more robust form. And his view was 
uh, that people who view and are surrounded by Indigenous art must be impacted by that art. So those people who are surrounded by the, the great buildings that emerge from an Indigenous way of knowing must be impacted by that as well. And some people will argue that Canada is greener because and more interested in sustainability because of that, that we're surrounded by that Indigenous art, Indigenous ways of knowing. So that's what really intrigued me when I remember you approached me first in the streets and said, what should we do together on this? And I just thought that, and, you, and because you have an incredible way of telling stories, and as far as I know, and Deanna, you can correct me, but my learning from, from elders has always been through stories. And the stories are so powerful. And Vivian, you were telling stories uh, and we then started to figure out maybe we should record these stories, validate them with the elders, and actually communicate with wider Canada on the power of what you, Vivian, learned from the elders and the various stories, particularly the grandfather stories, and how you map them uh, together with architectural practice. To me, that was so important and so powerful. And maybe you could uh, briefly go into some of that because that's what the book is about. It's about the stories and how you map the stories to architectural practice and then how that changed the way you move forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'd be, I'd be happy to add some of that, but I wonder whether Diana, would you want to add something before I go into that part of the story? I'll leave it up to you and I'll add if, if I feel like I need to, but you do have a very good storytelling voice. So please, please carry on. Okay, great. Well, I, I'll maybe share my screen here. Um, and um, I do have, I do have a few slides to, to sort of start with some of those stories. And I, I might, I might um, go into present mode because that reads better. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit um, and say that, you know, as I said, Diana was my first teacher. And when we were designing the school at Saddle Lake in the early 1990s, she and her dad invited me to meet with Elder Peter Ochis, who shared the Eagle Child story, which is what that sculpture in the center of the school mm -hmm. is about. Um, and for us to interpret um, that story into the design of the school in such a way that it could be both abstract and legible. So that was really the beginning of this journey. Um, and we realized that we had to develop a design process that engaged people in exploring what was important to them to invite the kids and the elders and the leadership in the community to guide us, um, to listen carefully and to really invite a level of conversation that isn't really typical. And so this, this photograph is actually from Pagani from down Southern Alberta. Um, and uh, we continue to this day and almost every week to do um, these kinds of engagements, these kinds of conversations with children, with teachers, with educators, with elders, and with so many um, important leaders in the community. And a long time ago in the process of sharing these visions, we really kept running into these pre-grandfather teachings. Um, this particular photograph is from the school at Peguis. And uh, Diana will recall that it was after we designed the school at Saddle Lake that we were invited to come and design a new school at Peguis. Mm -hmm. And at Peguis, the, they had, um, of course, the, the image in this slide um, is from the treaty, so long as the sun shines and the grasses grow and the rivers flow, so is the circle of life. Each of these items are intertwined to support life. And this is what really started to resonate for me was the idea that these teachings really 
draw strength from and give strength to the underlying treaties that form the basis of our relationship with indigenous communities in our country. And so often we don't remember that, but I think it's really critical. So one day as we were talking and as I was being asked by various educators and elders about how we go about making buildings, and people would ask, or in one particular case, an elder said, so tell me about the process of making the building. Like, how do you go from this vision to a building? And so I kind of described this really linear process like most good architects would, you know, first you design and then you detail and then you draw and then you get a contractor and then you build. And it was quite linear. And the elder said to me, well, you know, that's all well and good, dear, but you've got this all wrong. He said, you need to understand that this process is circular. And so we, he, he basically said, you know, think about this in this way. Think about that everything is in a circle and that if you've got a way of thinking about design and a way of, about thinking of construction, that it all wraps itself around, around in accordance with our teachings. And so I started to look at these grandfather teachings, those same ones, those same seven that were on those feathers that you saw a moment ago. And it occurred to me that it makes sense for us to start thinking about the process of design in alignment with these circular teachings. And so to think about envisioning or visioning our buildings with courage, courage to actually engage the whole community, which is still mm -hmm. to this day somewhat unusual in our Western world. Uh, people are afraid to engage too many people because they're afraid that they will create expectations. But we have to have the courage to actually invite the elders and the children and the next generation into that conversation. And then we have to plan our buildings with love, love for that community and for the teachings that have been given to us. And then we design with wisdom, wisdom that's drawn from traditional ways of knowing, but also from the Western canon, from the ways of architecture and the ways of building in today's world. And then we have to detail it with respect, uh, respect for the builders, the people who have to put the building together and then we actually get to build it, which is, of course, the moment of truth, because then everything has to come together. And finally, when, we, when we're done building, we need to have a lot of humility to celebrate what, what has been accomplished, but also to evaluate honestly what we've accomplished and what we can learn from that. And round we go again. And so this was really the core, and this really is the core of this book, is that these teachings really map to a design process and the design process leads to a kind of architecture that is really sustainable and integrated into the community and its stories. So I could go on for a while, but I think I'm going to pause there and go back to you, Fritz, and let you kind of um, continue, continue the conversation. <laughs> Uh, th thank you. I, I th what, one of the things that I noticed, and you may be too modest to say, is that you are a really great storyteller yourself. And you started uh, the book with your uh, own stories about Montreal and coming to Montreal. And that was your story that integrated with the other stories. And to me, this whole book is a book about stories. It's a different way of doing what we might consider in another world an academic approach. It isn't. It's an approach that is tempered with what we have learned about uh, the telling of stories. Uh, and, and maybe you want to take one of the stories, Vivian. There's so many good ones in the book. And tell us a bit about uh, well, either the early ones, or I still remember the story of the hospital up north, uh, but whatever story you want to tell, tell us in your own way. Okay, well, you know, I might jump ahead to that hospital up north, if you like. Yeah. There it is. 
Um, so it's, uh, so this is, um, up at Black Lake Stony Rapids. So a long ways north, it's actually on the Athabasca River, um, on the border between Saskatchewan and the Northwest Territories. And uh, it's on the Black Lake Reserve, but it's right adjacent to the town, which is kind of, um, yeah, a town uh, of Stony Rapids. And uh, what you see in this photograph is actually in the background, uh, the river, the actually Athabasca River. And one of the remarkable things about the Athabasca River is that even when it's minus 60 outside, it doesn't freeze. The rapids are so fast that the water runs year round and you can always hear the water running. Even when you can't see the river, you can hear the water running. So what was fascinating was during the design of this particular building, we actually flew into the five different communities that are served or that, that this hospital serves. So we flew into Fond du Lac and Camsel Portage, Uranium City and, and so on. And in each center, we met with chief and council, the kids um, in, in one community, we met with just about every single person who lived in that community uh, at the school that particular afternoon. And we invited them to share with us what their vision was of this hospital. And remarkably, they all said that what was really important was that the inpatient rooms, the, the rooms where people would stay overnight in this facility, all had to be able to face the river so that people could hear the sound of the water. Now, this was a bit of an unusual request because typically, as you know, hospitals have, you know, what's called a double loaded corridor. So rooms on both sides of a corridor. But what we were proposing was really to put all of the rooms on one side of the corridor and to put other functions like nursing stations and supply rooms and so on, on the inside. And this was a little bit of an unusual design and we had some differences of opinion with our friends at Saskatchewan Health, but ultimately um, the vision of the community prevailed and we designed this building with all the patient rooms facing the river. And uh, one fine day I was out on site and uh, I happened to be walking by a number of tradesmen who were sitting having their lunch and they didn't really know who I was and uh, so they were just talking to one another. And the one fellow said, do you know, you can hear the river from in here, it's really cool. And I thought, okay, that's the moment of truth, we got it. You know, when a, when a tradesman notices something that was designed and he doesn't know that it was intended, that's really success, right? And so those are the kinds of magical moments where we know that the voice of the community really drives design and execution and brings the buildings to life in a way that would never have happened had we not really done deep and thoughtful engagement and consultation with those communities. So that's kind of in a nutshell, that particular story. Yeah, and I liked in particular, Vivian, you're talking about how you persuaded uh, the government to uh, deal in timber and in local skills rather than imported concrete for that particular structure, which created employment and jobs and rooted the building within the community. Yeah, that was another important win. You're quite right, Fritz, that um, this was the other thing that we did was we made sure that this was a wood structure and, uh, you know, typically government buildings up there are all made out of concrete and concrete blocks and such. But um, in this community, they really had a lot of carpenters and they really wanted to make sure we created mm -hmm. jobs. So we definitely made that a priority. Yeah, I, th I thought that was a, a, a great story. Uh, I, I'm gonna uh, you know, have a chat now a bit about some of the uh, adventures in the creation of the book, just very quick. <laughs> quickly. It's uh, Vivian and I, uh, mostly Vivian, uh, we held a number of gatherings of elders and people who were involved in the various projects in Vivian's office. We recorded all of them 
and then we uh, edited them and then we shared them again with all the people who were there and that those sharings and those conversations are in fact the essence of the book so it was really a collaborative effort we tried as best we could to do the sharing of stories and make sure we never misrepresented any of the sayings of the elders or some of the uh, the, the indigenous contractors who also sh showed up and who were very useful. Gary in particular was, uh, was, was quite wonderful. So what happened then is I, you know, everything is fortuitous in life. I saw a course at the, the Banff Center for uh, Art and Creativity and enrolled. And it was a course on Indigenous creativity called Inherent Design, led by Yor Nango, a Sami architect, and Ursula Johnson, a Mi'kmaq artist from, uh, from Halifax. And there were about 20 of us. I was the only non-Indigenous person. So we had a wonderful time talking about art and what arts meant, what writing meant, what it meant within uh, the, the younger community. The best story I have there is here I am trying to pull this manuscript together, reflecting it back to the team and to Vivian just to make sure it was okay. But then the moment of truth arrived and it was, well, you know that this is an art uh, exercise, so you're going to you have a studio, so you're going to have to fill your studio for studio day when everyone comes to look at what you've done. And you sort of think, oh my goodness me, all I have is a manuscript. What can one do with the manuscript? And Jorn Angle said in a very wise way, he said, well, you put the manuscript up on the wall, all 350 pages uh, in large print, and you give everyone who comes felt pens and they can go and edit. And so not only was this manuscript uh, produced uh, in a collaborative storied way in Vivian's office, but it was also further refined and created in an environment of collaboration and community with uh, some very young indigenous artists. So it was a hugely privileged exercise to go and do this and learn so much from from everyone so this book does have a very unusual journey from uh, beginning to to end uh, now vivian i got to ask you this because you once said and you may regret having said this to me but that's okay that your practice with indigenous clients significantly altered the way you dealt with your non-Indigenous clients as well, and also the way you organized your office. And I must say that during the various meetings at your office, there were babies on the floor, there were dogs, there was food, there were all sorts of things going on. Uh, and so that struck me, hmm, that might be something you learned, but also the flexibility of the workplace and and what I'd call directed chaos. Anyway, do, do, I, do you want to speak to that? Because I think it's quite marvelous. Oh, well, thanks, Fritz. Well, you know, I guess we have been in, informed by working with Indigenous communities at so many levels that it's almost hard to to pull it apart or to un, unbraid <laughs> it from our core practices and you're right we do have um we do have i guess maybe controlled chaos is the is the term um but we have uh, a remarkably diverse and talented team of architects and engineers and designers and uh, yes, they bring sometimes their dogs to the office in the days when we used to come to the office and children <laughs> are always around. Um, and you know, it, you remind me of a story and it's not actually in the book, I don't think, but it's a story that I remember from when I was up in Fort Simpson and uh, I was working on a study for the Northwest Territories Housing Corporation and um, the 
housing corporation had arranged for us to do an evaluation of this program called the home ownership assistance program and so what my task was was to go every evening to meet with various families and interview them and learn about their experience with their homes but during the day i would just hang out at the offices of the NWT Housing Corporation and just sort of do my own thing and listen into what they were up to. And one fine day, they had this workshop. And I'll never forget this. They they had this facilitator coming in and this, you know, I'm talking about 25 years ago, right? They had a facilitator coming in and saying, you know, we sometimes have challenges between our Indigenous and our non-Indigenous staff. And they said, so we're going to do a little session called What Drives Me Crazy. And of course, they asked first um, the non-Indigenous staff, so, you know, the various people from all over Canada who worked there, um, you know, what drives you crazy? And they quickly said, well, you know, we're, we're struggling with the fact that our Indigenous colleagues don't always show up on time, and sometimes they're late, and sometimes they're out hunting, and that's a challenge for us. And then they asked the Indigenous group said, so what, what drives you crazy? And they said, well, you know, what drives us crazy is this obsession with time that you guys have. We don't understand why you're so obsessed. What's your problem? Like, we're going to get this done. Don't worry about it. So I thought, great, like, just reframe mm-hmm. how you're looking at things. Like, if we're going to do things together, let's do them together. And when they need to get done is when they will be done. And when there's other things that are more important, then we'll look after our babies or go hunting. And and that's all good because ultimately we're all in this journey together, right? So I think those are the kinds of moments where you sort of go, yeah, we need to think differently. We can't just kind of go by the punch the clock thing. That doesn't really serve us and certainly not in the 21st century. Oh, thanks for, for for that. No, and I've also noticed that that uh, the some of the uh, what I call the atmosphere in your uh, office reminds me of the atmosphere I value when I go to, let's say, Red Crow College or when I go to on the Blood Reserve. Or it, it isn't that it's chaos. It's what I call it's a it's caring. And that people they may fight, but they care passionately about uh, their their children and and their future. And really, your involvement in education uh, is uh, very very focused on what I call next generational learning as well. Do you want to talk uh, any anything about particularly the schools where I think you've done so much positive work? And maybe Deanna wants to pitch in on the schools too. Yeah, I think this is a great moment for Diana to to jump in on schools and then I'll also find a slide on schools, but Diana, go ahead. I I could just say that I was involved with one school that Vivian uh, designed and built and all through the the phases of construction. And um, I really enjoy that um, that was my first introduction to her. And this was way back in the 90s, 90, 92. And so <laughs> I was on the construction um, building committee because I was uh, the director of education in that community. And that was my home community. So my experience with Vivian was that we were tasked with creating the design and the flow of the colors, the patterning on the floors and all the other aesthetic qualities that bring all of the spaces of the school together. And the the committee basically gave us license, free license to interpret that on the basis of our ancestral knowledge and and the stories, particularly of of, um, 
stories that would be instructional or inspirational to young people because this was a junior senior high school and naturally i i wanted to take vivian to meet my my grandfather <laughs> who was um willing very willing to to teach uh, the story that of eagle child to vivian and we went a few times to listen to him and and uh tell this story over and over and over again and at one point um, Vivian said to the building committee here it is and so she on she revealed the colors and the design of the of the patterning and how she interpreted the story into the into the school building with with everything and it just was a moment of inspiration for me that she had the capacity to take a oral story and capture it so beautifully and vividly into a building <laughs> and uh, I was I was amazed and I was very pleased and the effect the final effect um, it, be it became a, a, a tool for teaching in in that school and it still is. In fact, we're going to take it further and build more curriculum around that that uh, particular story. But that's my experience of Vivian, and she is just gifted with the capacity to listen, and through listening, interpret um, in something that is intangible, like a story, into a very tangible building design. So that's what I want to share. And I'll pass it back to Vivian. Thanks, Diana. And so um, in this photograph, which you'll see on the screen, you might recognize this photograph. It's from a very long time ago. But there's Diana on the right-hand side there. Um, and uh, all of the um, various um, dignitaries and uh, politicians and uh, representatives of the department of what was then the Department of Indian Affairs uh, and of course the chief was there. Um, and this was the plaque unveiling, as you can see. And what was also memorable for me in that particular groundbreaking, and again, this is kind of goes to this teaching of humility was, you know, the, the, um, the regional director general of Indian affairs said, he didn't think that he would ever live to see a junior senior high school on reserve. And so this was the first junior senior high school that was ever built on reserve. And it was considered that, you know, maybe elementary school was well and good to have on reserve, but really that kids would be expected to leave their reserve and, you know, integrate themselves or assimilate as we might say today. And so this was really the beginning of the journey of having indigenous controlled education. And um, I know Diana and, Others have continued to work very hard around building an educational legal system or an educational law that in, informs a way of thinking about education that isn't just taking the Western curriculum and you know, applying it to a beautifully designed building, but actually reconsidering the curriculum. So what I love about this is that, you know, the, the stories inform the architecture and then the architecture informs the curriculum and it keeps going around and around and in as, as it should. So I don't know, maybe, maybe, I don't know, back to you Fritz, or is it time to open it up for questions? What's your feeling? Oh, I'll, I'll make one. Uh, before we open it up to questions, which I think is a great idea, uh, I just want to mention the publisher and why we why we chose the publishers we did. This book is published by uh, Brush, but as important by Red Crow College. This is the first imprint uh, of this uh, of the college. And Vivian and I felt very, very strongly that this book should be published by uh, an Indigenous publisher. And Brush was great um, for their part because they published the, uh, the copy standards uh, 
for indigenous authors, and that book is uh, used throughout North America. But having read Crone the Elders and the president agreed to take this on was a huge endeavor. And what the results will be, uh, we hope will be re as remarkable as we think the journey of the book was. We hope that Red Crow College, uh, actually, uh, that, red, that Red Crow, I got to get my head up. So, <laughs> yeah, so that Red Crow College will develop its own Indigenous press and determine what they wish to publish. Uh, the other thing that everyone should know as well is that we uh, have turned over the royalties to Red Crow College so that they will be used for, for, for students. So this book is an inspiration of Indigenous architecture from Indigenous elders, and we hope that it always gets returned back to the community, and we hope that there is an awful lot more books coming out in the, in the, in the next while from an Indigenous press. Uh, with that being said, I think, Vivian, you're right. Let's open it up to questions from the floor. And I'll adjust my camera so there's more of me on here. For sure. And, and I also want to note that, of course, Diana Steinhauer is also the president of Yellowhead Tribal College. And Yellowhead right. Tribal College was also um, an Indigenous institution. There's only a handful of Indigenous post-secondaries in the province. And I've really been impressed with the work that has been happening at Red Co, but also at Yellowhead Tribal oh, College, yeah. especially under Diana's leadership, um, with the amount of programming and the number of courses and the openness of their curriculum. I'm going to start to encourage all my staff to start taking courses through Yellowhead Tribal College. And I <laughs> I think it's really important that we all start, continue to learn, continue on this journey of learning. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, with that, I think it's a great time for questions. So if we could get people to write their questions in the chat. Then um, yeah, there we go. Now you can just now you can just see the two of us. I think the screen sharing is done, oh. um, but we can we can go back to specific stories if people are curious. But uh, yeah, open for questions or comments or curiosities. We have a very quiet crowd here this evening. Yeah. I mean, I see Marilyn and Mark and Sherry on here, and I see Tiffany, who was much involved in the book as well, and who was a, a student at, at Banff when I, when I was there. I also, uh, you know, see a few other names that I know. So, uh, and I'm sure uh, Catherine as well, have me. So, if anybody wants to. Uh, pose a question, please do so. If not, you're going to be subject to more of Vivian and me. <laughs> um, okay, so Tiffany has asked a question in the chat saying, how are we finding the process of releasing the books, surprises or expectations for both of us? Okay, well, maybe Fritz, do you want to answer that or? Well, it's still early days and <laughs> uh, uh, I think what uh, it, it's an, a very normal release. It, it's uh, Vivian took the great, I wouldn't say risk, but she did the noble thing of acquiring a bunch of the first print run and is using them to distribute the good word. I know that the people at Red Crow are quite pleased. We sent a uh, Roy Weaselfat, the president, a significant number, and they're sufficiently interested in the book and how it was put together that they would like to explore alternatives and how you, they might do more in the future. So we think that uh, it's so far, so far so good. <laughs> uh, will it be pleasing to everyone? I doubt it. Will it challenge some people? We hope so, because that's the intent. And my intent and why I feel so passionate about this book is I believe, and this comes from a story that uh, old Joe Croce, who read, 
Croshu's dad once said to me, he, he said, yeah, you guys may think we're yesterday's people, he said, but you know, there'll be a time when you need us. And he was absolutely right, because of what uh, the Indigenous community has taught us is uh, taught us an awful lot about environment, about how we can deal with each other better. And there's goes on. And I actually think there was a considerable amount of wisdom, uh, uh, wisdom there. So I see this in uh, architecture, I see this in art, I see it in many, many places. Uh, and I think uh, if Canada has a strong future, it's going to be because we are starting to learn from each other and it's taken a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can just add to that, that certainly from my perspective, I mean, I've done a few of these kind of book launch events and um, increasingly, I think people are, are fascinated <clears throat> partly because of the work that we've done working in collaboration with Indigenous communities and partly because I think people are curious about the process of architecture and there are very few books that speak about how architecture actually happens um, that are accessible and so I've found really positive comments from people who you know, may not have ever had any contact with Indigenous communities, but of course are surrounded by buildings and architecture and have always been curious, like how does that work? And so it this book I think has provided some, has provided some entry points perhaps yeah. um, for a much larger audience than I might have even expected. And I, so I think I, Vivian, you've also pulled the vocabularies, indigenous vocabularies and architectural vocabularies together. And by doing so, you've made it more straightforward, I think. Uh, I, I'll admit that I always thought architects were a bit of a mystery, but the moment I got in all the old stories, New Ways book, it became much, much clearer. So using the indigenous lens, I could understand mysteries a little better. Hmm. Oh, that's neat. Um, now I see some more questions popping up in the chat. Um, how have you found engagement with Indigenous youth to be in our research efforts? What is their level of energy with respect to teachings of the elders? Well, you know, we've had great um, conversations with youth over the years. And I think a lot of the credit does go to the elders. Often when we work in communities, you know, the elders are consistently in the schools, they're in the communities, and so they're already actively engaged. And when we're there, we find that the, the elders and their teachings really are already present in the worldview that the youth have. And so when they share their visions and their dreams, they are often framed in Indigenous worldviews. And interestingly, even when we work in urban Indigenous communities, and we've worked a lot with um, urban inner city communities, as well as, you know, with Yellowhead Tribal College in the city, um, in terms of, you know, dealing with students and with educators. And we found, again, that you know, the more we can bring in elders and their perspectives and their teachings, the more the design resonates for everybody. So that, that's been really powerful. Do you want me to give a try on, on uh, that? That was, I can add to that. It's my experience on uh, the, the blood reserve and I do uh, are, I'm involved in Red Crow College, is the youth are very engaged. They're at most of the board meetings, and I would say they know exactly what's going on and what expectations are. Just like in any community, there are good kids and bad kids, <laughs> troubled kids and happy kids. But I'd say I've never met such uh, uh, students who are so passionate about their learning, uh, and it really is, uh, I think, remarkable. Uh, if we move on to Sherry's question, uh, how, how can the Indigenous perspective be incorporated into cultural components other than architecture? Long time ago, and this idea is still alive, 
a number of us worked with Reg Croshu on how we might use indigenous ways of knowing to better manage an organization. And through his book, which was published ultimately by University of Calgary Press, but he was suggesting that if we were to hold meetings and were cognizant of the way, in his case, Pekini held meetings, we would have better outcomes. And believe it or not, I thought, okay, in for a penny, in for a pound, let's give it a try. And we did uh, have meetings and we did set the plan in the room. Uh, the knowledge holder sat where he said they would and we, we conducted ourselves according to uh, the, the, the Blackfoot ways of knowing and holding meetings. And did it make a difference? Yes, it did. It made the meetings better, more effective, and people more respectful. We did go for a big shirt grant to try to figure out how we could do more with this, but Shirk wasn't as in wasn't that interested at the time. But I think they might be now because I do think that, uh, as you know, Reg used to hold the justice camps too around Fort McLeod, and they were done from an indigenous way of knowing. So I think. The time has come uh, and the uh, granting councils are now more open than they ever were. So I'd say, well, I think it's time to go for it again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Never give up. <laughs> yeah, well, and just to add to that, you know, Fritz, when I became chair of the Board of Governors of Athabasca University, I remember that I asked you whether Athabasca University had a resident elder and you advised me that uh, Maria Campbell, who is a Métis mm -hmm. elder, um, actually who lives in Saskatchewan, but had been Athabasca University's elder for many years. And um, I was delighted to meet Maria. And, you know, she had in the past been invited to convocations. And so I was fortunate to meet her at the very first convocation that I attended. Um, and then when I took the chair of the Board of Governors, it became apparent to me that this organization um, had had some had had some challenges and it needed centering. And so mm. I, I asked Maria if she would be willing to come to a board meeting and in fact to a board retreat and to share with us her perspectives and to help build a culture around our board table. And she was gracious enough to accept that invitation. And uh, her presence in the room and her ability to bring us into a circle um, was extraordinarily powerful and really created a, an aligned board that hadn't been aligned previously. And uh, what Maria basically said amongst many wise things she said is, she said, you know, when we stand in the circle and we look to the center, we, in the center of the circle are our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. So our work together is for them. And so mm -hmm. we're aligned around shared purpose and we may have different perspectives, which is good and healthy. And we bring ourselves together around the center of the circle or, or around the fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really helped to shift the conversation at our board. Um, so not just in cultural components, but in organizational mm -hmm. settings, as Fritz says, um, we bring indigenous perspectives and their transformative. Yeah, and she is one of the most remarkable elders, I'll admit, uh, I have ever come across. She, she, when she enters a room, I always stand. She is so incredibly regal and wise when she moves. I, I, I she just makes me. <laughs> uh, I see there, there's another question, Vivian, that you might want to answer. Um, yeah, Jim and Betty Fish asked, uh, is there a building in Edmonton that we've designed that would be an example of stories informing the design of the building? Um, well, I think the most kind of um, 
apparent one, I guess, is is a little bit hard to see because it's the Amiskwachi Academy, which is the um, mm. indigenous high school, which was a transformation of the um, former air terminal building at uh, Blatchford. Mm -hmm. So if ever you have the opportunity to go inside, um, I think that one really shows how stories informed the design. Um, we would love to do something similar with Yellowhead Tribal College's building in the former <laughs> Orange Hub. So one day we will get to transform that uh, when some funding materializes. Um, and um, what else in Edmonton could I speak to that is really informed by storytelling? I mean, I, you know, I, I think every project that we do is in some ways informed by storytelling. Um, but uh, another fun example in the city, and this one is less about an Indigenous um, story, but more about the story of an organization, is the St. John Ambulance Building that you might uh, know up on 124th Street and 111th Avenue, um, was informed by the 900-year-old history of the Order of St. John. And so the design, if you look carefully, has a sort of a past with its sort of tower, a present with its kind of more conventional office building and a future that looks to the east. So again, informed by indigenous worldviews. Um, oh, and Diana also said the Mosaic Center. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the Mosaic Center is, is definitely an example of great uh, design. And then Tiffany says the Rossdale story. Yes, and that's that's a good one. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, so that's the indigenous burial ground. Um, and that was a fascinating and incredibly complex project because we were actually hired by the city of Edmonton to help them navigate um, the many different indigenous mm -hmm. Um, groups, including uh, Métis, Blackfoot, Cree, Dene, um, who all held that there were burial, uh, that there was a burial ground in that location that was just outside of the walls of old Fort Edmonton. Mm -hmm. And I think every historian and, and archaeologist agreed that there was a burial ground there. Mm -hmm. The challenge was how to uh, represent that burial ground because, um, you know, the Métis community um, wanted, of course, Métis symbolism. Um, and there was a Christian community of various Indigenous groups who wanted to make sure that there was a, a Christian kind of marker or a cross. And then there were others who said, you know, under no circumstance should there be a cross. And so we were challenge to create something that was both a cross and not a cross. Um, and this is one of the fun things in design is how you can create something that does both of those things. So if you if you ever drive by down at Rossdale, and I actually could put it up on the screen if you like, but if you ever drive by at Rossdale, if you look at that marker in the center of the site, from certain angles, it could read as a cross. But in plan, it has a circle that is broken to suggest the indigenous story and the, the broken circle of life that happened as a result of mm -hmm. colonization. And then in plan, you can also see the Métis uh, infinity symbol. So all of those symbols are layered upon each other. And depending on which angle you look at it, you might see one or you might see the other or you might <laughs> see one of them. So it's intended to be a very physical, but also a very ephemeral um, representation of everything that everybody needed for it to be, including a cross and not a cross. <laughs> it is everything to everyone. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and of course, the other thing Tiffany just notes in the in the chat is that the mosaic is also a great example because it really pushes the sustainability, which mm -hmm. is very much what we've learned from First Nations and Métis people is to really live lightly on the earth and use as little resource as is possible. So that's the first net zero commercial building in Alberta. 
and um, will, you know, remain as a building that continues to generate more electricity and more energy than it consumes, which I think is extraordinary. And it's super important because that's how people survived on this land for centuries and centuries. Yep. Uh, that, and and uh, Wendy Dickin is asked everyone, are there any up and coming indigenous architects uh, that, uh, that are engaged in conventional projects? Well, there are some who are actually involved in the conversation. Anyway, I'll let you deal with that, Vivian. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tiffany Shaw Collins, who is one of our associates in our firm, uh, is uh, very definitely front and center in this conversation. So uh, thank you, Tiffany, for being here. And maybe you could turn on your, I don't know if you can turn on your camera and, or if you have other things happening. But um, yes, Tiffany is definitely the um, up and coming indigenous architect who I think will make the, a, a huge impact and will continue these stories. And we continue to collaborate. Um, Métis Crossing is an extraordinarily interesting project. So I'm going to invite you all as soon as COVID is done to go <laughs> up Métis Crossing, which is um, up by Smoky Lake mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, have your next cultural celebration or wedding or corporate retreat there. Uh, we've designed, Tiffany's designed a marvelous uh, cultural gathering center. And right now under construction is a the, um, the boutique hotel will um, will uh, allow you to stay over there coming up this fall. So as soon as COVID is done, do go and plan your next event up at uh, Métis Crossing. Yeah, and, and Vivian, we, there was uh, mentioned in the book is uh, Wanda de la Costa is also a, a practicing architect in the US who has, uh, who, who is, holds a chair, I believe, in a university down there as well. Absolutely, and and Wanda is is an you know is from here from Saddle Lake actually, and uh, she's uh, definitely an important indigenous architect who's uh, making a huge contribution globally right now. Yep. So so things are changing, but too slowly. We, we would all argue. I I noticed the the time. And it's 8.04, <laughs> and we promised not to uh, to it, have you belong too much uh, uh, for an extended a period of time, although Vivian and I will hang around after uh, 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 Shelf Life leaves. But be before we uh, 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 sort of wind up, I would like to thank a number of people who've made this project possible. And uh, some of them are very quiet. I noticed that Glenn was and is probably still online. He was the uh, owner and publisher of uh, 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 Brush Education and, uh, Publishing and has done an incredible number of uh, books relating to uh, First Nations. And his wisdom and how we put this together and make it work is really quite incredibly valuable and he will be uh, working in the workshops with the Red Crow College to help establish uh, uh, an academic press at that uh, college. Also want to thank Lori uh, Seidlitz who uh, did all of the copying editing and put up with all of our varying perspectives and uh, she <laughs> I, I hope she's uh, lived to tell about it. It was exciting if nothing else. And then I've mentioned earlier, I really want to thank Red Crow College because uh, the faith that Roy Weasel Fat put and the elders put in us to allow us to publish it without going through every word was huge. Uh, and uh, I hope he doesn't regret anything. So far, he seems very pleased. Uh, and I would also like to thank uh, my dean, uh, Veronica Thompson, uh, she was uh, she's now the provost at uh, Royal Roads in British Columbia, but uh, she allowed me to carry over my <laughs> research stipends and my oh, you know, publishing support stipends for several years when she perhaps was being pressed not to do it. So <laughs> anyway, she she uh, made uh, this all financially 
possible. And then, of course, I can't thank the incredible elders who came to these meetings in Vivian's office. For many of them, and, and it was an, an exercise in faith. And uh, we hope we haven't let anyone down and that we hope that the book actually does make an impact and, and, and helps inform people about uh, the new knowledge that exists in all of us and in indigenous communities in particular. And one thing that I've learned is that we are story people and that if you can tell a good story and I'm still learning, I'm not as good as Vivian or the elders, but if you can start telling a good story with a good core uh, and know your traditions, you, you, you can convey very, very powerful messages. So anyway, with that, I'll turn it over to Vivian, who I know has got things to say too. For sure. Well, thank you, first of all, Fritz, for your patience and your tenacity in helping to make this come together. It's been an extraordinary journey and I really, it would never have happened without you. So thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to Diana for the brilliant mm. forward that you wrote that was really generous and kind and lovely and uh, so really powerful and made that the whole book come together. Uh, thank you to Tiffany for all the great work that you and I continue to do together. And uh, also to our uh, to my colleagues, um, Richard Isaac and the rest of the team at Manaska Isaac. Um, the Manask Isaac firm name is going to be changing very soon. So keep your eyes peeled for social media. We're going to be reimagining our name. And so really excited to uh, do that. And uh, we're really delighted to be continuing the journey. Um, we are actually working as we speak. We continue to work with um, communities um, up in Whitehorse, where we're working with the Quinlan Dunn First Nation uh, down in Southern Alberta, actually working with Kainai right now on a new elementary school, mm. um, working um, in Saskatchewan with the Papikasas First Nation. Uh, and of course, we continue to work across Northern Alberta uh, with Lubicon and others. So we're honored to continue this journey and uh, would love to uh, share more stories with you as as those evolve. So um, yeah, thanks to all of you for that. And uh, with that, I think we'll maybe turn it back over to uh, Jonat Shelf Life. Hi, thank you, thank you, Vivian.